Good morning. I do want to say that we, we have a, a for sure one first time visitor today with uh, Davy Carol O'Brien. She was just born. She's... How many days? Weeks? A little over two weeks. Ooh, just over two weeks. So remember, we got germs and she don't. And uh, all that kind of stuff. But she's here and. Uh, Adam and Aaron are very proud of that. We're glad you're here. Uh, today, we're, I'm going to be speaking today from Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. I encourage you to turn there. I don't have any of those verses on the screen today. I encourage everybody to turn there. I'll be in Luke 1, verses 26 to 56. But we won't read those all at the same time. In Luke chapter 1, this sermon called A Kingdom for the Humble. When you turn there, the silence in Luke chapter 1 has been broken. A preacher, what do you mean by that? Well, in the Old Testament, the last writer in the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi was written 400 years before Jesus. And for 400 years, no prophecies, no prophets, no revelation, no angels. Silence. Now it seems like God, God's asleep, or, or God doesn't care, or God's not at work. But yet in what we see as we study world history, the Babylonians ruled, then the Medes and the Persians, then the Greeks, then the Romans. And highways are being established and synagogues are being built. And everything's being perfected. And we've just entered what we call in, in world history, it's the Roman, uh, the, the Pax Romana. It's a period of peace for about 200 years. It's just the right time for the greatest message the world will ever know. The silence has been broken. In chapter 1 of Luke, there's an angelic appearance to a woman, uh, to a man named Zachariah who's a priest. And just after that, the same angel, the angel Gabriel, goes to see a girl, a virgin girl named Mary. And Luke 1, verse 26, verse 26 says, in the sixth month, now that's not June, this is the sixth month of, of, of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Zechariah and Elizabeth, Zechariah was the priest, Elizabeth, his wife, she's pregnant, and it's in the sixth month of her pregnancy. And that's where we pick up. And this angelic encounter will be in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. The Bible says this. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin, pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel. Since I'm a virgin. The angel answered. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. 
For nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible with God. I am Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, your mercy extends to those who fear you from generation to generation. You built your kingdom, and your kingdom on earth is the church, and it is for those who humble themselves they can enter through, through obedience to your word because your grace is sufficient. May your word be preached in this place one more time. May you be glorified here. And we ask that you grow your church here and around the world today. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. In Luke chapter 1, the verses we just looked at, verses 26 to 38, without any ambiguity, the angel says to this young lady, the angel goes to a town called Nazareth. Nazareth is, Nazareth is never mentioned in the Old Testament. I wonder if Gabriel had to use Google Earth to find it. It's a small place. He goes to this young lady, pledged to be married. It's called a betrothal. It's an engagement, a formal engagement. To break such an engagement, she had to file a divorce. But she's engaged. <coughs> she's a virgin. And the angel says, you're going to be with child. And his kingdom will never end. The angel says to Mary in Luke chapter 1, a kingdom is coming and it's immediate. Now the Jewish people have been looking for a kingdom. From the time that Abraham was called, you leave your country, God said, go to the land I will show you. And God says to Abraham in Genesis 22, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed. The Jewish people were looking for the offspring of Abraham. A redeemer, a king, a messiah. But God's more specific than just Abraham. God says it's going to be, you know, it was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. God says it's going to be Judah. That's what he says. Genesis 49, verse 10, the scepter will not depart from Judah. Judah. It's going to be from the tribe of Judah, but more specific. After Judah lived and died several hundred years, there was a man, a man after God's own heart. A man named David, who was a king, who was first a shepherd and then a king. And God says in Psalm 89, verse 29, about King David, I will establish his throne forever. A kingdom is coming. The Jewish people are looking for a kingdom, you know, a king, a Messiah, the anointed one. They're looking, they're expecting eagerly. That's what the prophet said. The prophet Isaiah, whose name means a salvation of Jehovah. Isaiah said, chapter 9, you hear it, I believe, every December. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David. David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. A kingdom is coming, a kingdom. That's what all the prophets say. Bit by bit and piece by piece, the puzzle comes together. Jeremiah the prophet said, Jeremiah 23, verse 5, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king. a king. Raise up to David, the tribe of Judah, David. I will establish his line forever. The days are coming. I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king, who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. You, you hear what the Spirit is saying. The angel Gabriel goes to Mary and he says, Mary, you're going to be with child. And he will be great. Now you read Luke chapter 1. And you read the announcement to Zechariah and he says, you know, your wife Elizabeth, you, when you go home and, and you and your wife Elizabeth come together, she's going to become pregnant and, and he will be a joy and delight to you. And he will be great in the sight of God. John the Baptist. But that's not what the angel says about Jesus. Luke chapter 1 verse 32 and 33 says, He will be great. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. David and he will reign on the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary knows the Scripture, you see. The Jewish people, they taught their children. 
They've been looking for a kingdom, the Messiah, the anointed one, all this time, all these years. It's here, baby. It's what you've been looking for. And she asked, how will this be? And, and the angel explains, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Now in the foreknowledge of God we see as this angel gives this young, uh, young perhaps a teenager, based on the historical you know, normalcy of the Jewish people, it's likely she was a teenager, this young virgin girl, and she has this question, the angel explains, and, and the angel says, in the foreknowledge of God, you see it coming together. Even Elizabeth, verse 36, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she was said to be barren in her sixth month. Now when you read Luke chapter 1, and you read 24, verse 24 and 25, it says, Elizabeth remained in seclusion. For five months. Nobody knew she was pregnant, you see. They're relatives, but they hadn't heard yet. But now the angel says, So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God, verse 36. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. You see, as Mary has had this angelic encounter, she's one of us, you know. And the questions that had to run through that girl's mind. Did that really happen? Did I really see an angel? Who's going to believe this story? <laughs> Who's going to believe that this really happened? What am I going to do? And when the angel leaves Mary, <coughs> verse, the next verse, verse 39 says, At that time, Mary got ready and hurried. We're going to look at that in a minute. A minute. She hurried to Zachariah's house. Now, imagine as she travels the distance. Now, how, the, how she pulled that off, the logistics of, of getting permission from her parents and getting to Zachariah's home, we don't know because the Bible doesn't say. But she makes the journey. She hurries. She makes the journey. And can you just imagine? Her little heart's racing. Zachariah, Elizabeth, in her old age, she's pregnant. I mean, I know this, and she should think it's strange that I know it when she hadn't told anybody. And, and I want to tell her this, and I hope she believes me. And, and what is she going to say? And is she going to be receptive? Is anybody going to believe what I've got to say here? I saw an angel. I swear I did. And notice what happens. Uh, read, read back there. Luke chapter 1, verse 39 to 45. Verse 39 says, At that time Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in a womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed. Mary doesn't say anything, you see. Elizabeth does the talking. And Elizabeth says, in a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. Mary didn't have to say anything at all. God had it all planned out. Mary goes to Elizabeth's house. Elizabeth gives, Elizabeth gives the message. Blessed is she who has believed the child why should the mother of my Lord come to me? And we got to ask ourselves, what is the reason here? Why? I mean, it's a fair, it's a legitimate question. Why was Mary so, so chosen? You know why? why? Why did God choose this girl from Nazareth, a no-name town? Why did God choose this girl? <coughs> to be the chosen one, the virgin will be with child and give birth to a son. Why, why her? I'm convinced God chooses her for the same reason that He chose her great-great-granddaddy, you know. She was a person after God's own heart. Now ponder on that. Go home today and read about Saul, the first king of Israel, and David, the second king of Israel. And you read, they, they both had some tremendous errors they made. They both sinned pretty greatly. 
David and Saul both. But yet Saul was rejected and David was accepted. What's the difference? It doesn't seem fair. God judges the heart. And David was a man after God's own heart. And I believe Mary's the same. When we see Mary act here in the Scripture, this is her passage in Luke chapter 1. It's called Mary's Song. And it goes from Luke chapter 1 verse 36 down to verse 40. I'm sorry, verse 46 down to verse 56. Luke 1, 46 to 56. And notice her humility. Now this old girl's got reason to be proud, you know. I mean, she is the one, the, the, host, the chosen one. The kingdom is coming and it's here and it's my boy. You know what? She had reason to be proud. I mean, I mean you don't, but she did, you know. You reckon she had? You reckon she had a bumper sticker on the back of her chariot that said, My son is the reason for the season. You reckon? You reckon if she had a bumper sticker on the back of her chariot that said, My son created your honor roll student? <laughs> she could have. You read this song in Luke chapter 1, verse 46 to 56. And the word he occurs seven times in the NIV. The word his occurs six times. It's all about him, God Almighty. It's all about his glory. And notice her humility here. If you want to know why Mary was chosen, notice her humility. Luke 1, verse 46 to 56, the Bible says this. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For He has been mindful of the humble state of His servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is His name. His mercy extends to those who fear Him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with His arms. With His arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped His servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as He said to our fathers. Verse 56 says, Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. But did you hear her humility? And we see this story, and we read it probably every December. Most of us, we hear it. And the angel went to Mary, and Mary went to Elizabeth. And then Mary had this song that she sang. It's called Mary's Song. And we see what the Scripture says, and we see what's there. But we reach the point of the sermon. Well, we're looking for an application. And we ask the question, what, what about you? That's what the Bible says how to apply it to my life today. Have you considered here the humility of this girl? Humility, if you think humility is good, do your head like this right here. It is, man. Humility is like the door that opens up for God's favor. That's what it is. The book of Proverbs says humility brings honor. Notice, a man's pride brings him low, but a man of lowly spirit gains honor. Not just honor, it gives you life and it gives you wealth. If you want life and wealth, you can do your head like this right here. The book of Proverbs says humility and the fear of the Lord bring wealth and life. The God says to the prophet Isaiah, He says, this is who I favor. This is the one I esteem, God says. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. This is who I favor. Those who are humble, you see. Now Luke chapter 1, verse 52, Mary said, uh, God, he, he has brought down rulers from the thrones, but has given, you know, lifted up, He has lifted up the humble. Now you could read what Mary said. Or you can read what James said, James chapter 4, verse 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will lift you up. Peter says, as he quotes from the Old Testament, Peter says, God opposes the grace. Um, I'm sorry, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And man, if you need grace, mm -hmm. and we all do, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And notice what Mary says here. This young Israelite girl who would raise the one, you know, he, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Philippians chapter 2. He was humble. He was lowly. And he suffered death, even death on a cross. This girl was humble. And she says in her, in her song, he says, God has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. 
You know what? We, we have a work day, I think, pretty well twice a year in the spring and fall, I believe. And, and you can volunteer to come out for work day, and, and you can be outside. And you're wearing your work clothes, and you know, it's modest dress, you know. You got blue jeans, maybe holes in them, that kind of stuff. And, and you're out in the yard picking up trash that somebody else threw off a highway, you know. And that is a humble attire, and that is a humble position, and that is a humble, that's a humble thing to do, you know. I encourage you to do it. But if you're there in the yard with your work clothes on, you're picking up somebody else's trash. You could be thinking on the inside. Ain't I a good little Christian? Where's all them other church people at, man? I'm seeing them out here on Saturday morning sweating. Ain't I something? Ain't I? Ain't God proud of me today? Ain't He? He has scattered those who are proud or in most thoughts. Now how am I going to know if you're proud picking up trash out there? I'm not going to know. And you're not going to know if I'm proud out there picking up trash. But I'll tell you who does know. God knows. And He has scattered those who are proud or in most thoughts. He lifts up the humble. He gives grace to the humble. He, he picks, He chooses, He uses the humble. He did down through Scripture. Do you know the Bible says in the law of Moses, Moses was the most humble man on the planet. You know that? God uses the humble. It's a door for His favor. And I'm just asking today, what about you? Have you humbled yourselves before the Lord? And this is a legitimate question for everybody in the building. Because if you're here and you're a Christian, and you've been a Christian for decades, are you continually humbling yourselves before the Lord? Will you humble yourself this week? Will you pick up the Bible and read it? Not, not just to say that you read a chapter. Will you read it to study? Like, you know, like it really came from heaven? Like it did? Like it really is inspired by the Holy Spirit? Like it is? Will you read it for, for guidance? For what you need to do and how you need to live this week? Will you humble yourselves? You know what that says? Is I don't know it all. I'm still learning. I'm still growing here. Will you humble yourself? Will you humble yourselves before the Lord and pray? I mean, pray not just, you know, uh, my co-worker's uncle's got cancer. Oh, Lord, pray for her uncle. she got cancer. I mean, pray like God's really going to hear what you got to say. I mean, pray like God's really going to answer it, you know. I mean, to pray like you've got a direct line to the third heaven, the most holy place. Will you humble yourselves and pray? You can enter that throne room with confidence because of Jesus Christ, our high priest. It says in the book of Hebrews chapter 4. Will you, will you humble yourselves knowing that God's in control and you're not? <coughs> will you humble yourselves before the Lord? If you're here and you're not a Christian, you see what God requires of us? He wants us to realize that I can't do it on my own. I've made a mess of things. I've made a ton of mistakes. And then the devil's going to beat you up with the sins of your past. But through the grace of God, you can be forgiven, and that's a promise. But will you humble yourselves and accept forgiveness? Will you humble yourselves before the Lord and say, my marriage is a mess. Other people think I've got to figure it figured out, but, but I don't. Will you humble yourselves before the Lord and ask for help? Will you humble yourselves before the Lord? we got the Spirit, Christians do, that cries out, Abba, which means Father. Abba, Father. Will you cry for help? Have you ever had a youngin? Have you ever had a youngin? You're youngin, or you know one youngin that loves you, and they come over to you, and they're two years old, and they barely can, you know, get this walk and run thing down, and they just come over. And, uh, uh. My littlest one said, "Daddy, hold you. Daddy, hold you." <laughs> you think it doesn't please the Father? We're created in His image. We're designed for integrity in the image of God. We're created. You think it doesn't please God? We say that. Father, hold me. Hold you. Humble yourselves before the Lord. And He will lift you up. Amen. Have you humbled yourselves before the Lord? Because what I'm saying here, where we started was with the kingdom. And the Jewish people were looking for a kingdom. The kingdom's real and the scepter will not depart from Judah. And I will establish His line forever. And the days are coming, declares the Lord. A righteous branch from the seed of David is coming a kingdom. Humble yourselves before the Lord because the kingdom is real. 
And throughout the Bible and the Old Testament and the New. In the book of Daniel, Daniel interprets a dream there in chapter 2. A dream that Nebuchadnezzar has, but Daniel says there will be four kingdoms. You know, the Babylonian kingdom, Nebuchadnezzar was the Babylonian king. After that, it was the, Greek, the Medes and the Persians. They shared authority. Then it was the Greeks who ruled the world. Everybody spoke a little Greek. The New Testament was written in Greek, you should know. Then it was the Romans, the fourth kingdom. <coughs> and Daniel says in this dream, all these years before Jesus, almost 600, Daniel says this, he says, in the time of that fourth kingdom, in the time of those kings, those Caesars, when we study world history, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. It itself will endure forever. A kingdom. And the word king pretty well implies a king. You're not a king if you don't have a kingdom, right? Jesus is the king. You know, his kingdom, the angel said to Mary, his kingdom will never end. And where is his kingdom at? Jesus said in Caesarea Philippi when Peter first Peter's the first of the apostles that declares Jesus is the Messiah. And Jesus says, Peter, upon this rock, on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom. When you read verse 18, 19, read it again. I will build my church. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. What kingdom is that? Upon this rock I'll build my church. The, the church and the kingdom are interchangeable, you see. In the time of the Roman governors, the Roman Caesars, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven has set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Christian, you're in the kingdom. Christian, you are royal. You are a chosen people because that's what the New Testament says. Read it with me. Colossians 1. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom. Of the Son He loves. It's past tense. You're already in it, Christian. You're saved by the grace of God. You're washed in the blood of Christ. You're in the kingdom. Peter says, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You're chosen. You're royal. You're holy. Christian, you are the church. Revelation, John says this, To Him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by His blood and has made us to be a... Kingdom. A kingdom and priest to serve as God and Father to Him be glory and power forever. Amen. You're a kingdom. And I'm going to be honest. I don't know a single person in this assembly who lives in a castle. <laughs> I drove in this morning. I got here before some of you did. It's rare that I do that. But uh, I didn't see a single Ferrari parked outside. But you're royal. Christian, you, you may not live extravagantly. You may not live. The world may not think you're a, 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 in a kingdom. The world may not see that you got an exclusive relationship with the king of all kings. Not from the things that you have, the materials you have, but by the grace of God and the word of God, you're in the kingdom. Christian, it's a new life. It's holy and pleasing to God. It's how we live. It's the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. It's, it's a new life. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. It's a hope that we're looking for the city whose architect and builder is God. Our faith, just like Abraham, is credited to us as righteousness. And by the blood of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Amen. Christian, you're in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. It's for the humble. If you're here today and you never obeyed the gospel, this kingdom is real. And it's the word of God and it will never end. And the gates of hell never prevail against it. But you're only going to enter if you humble yourselves and obey. As the gospel was preached for the first time in Acts chapter 2, and that's when the kingdom, before Acts chapter 2, there's no kingdom, you see. And what a huge theological point that is. I mean, the thief on the cross couldn't be in the kingdom because the kingdom didn't exist. You see that, right? The thief on the cross couldn't be washed in the blood because there's no blood to be washed in. You see that, right? But when the kingdom was preached and the kingdom was established, at Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, you know what Peter said? He said, save yourselves. Chapter 2, verse 40. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. That's something you got to do. And he had told them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the Holy Spirit. Save yourselves. And that takes a lot of humility. 
Will you humble yourselves before the Lord? You don't have it all figured out. Your life's a mess. You're struggling with sin. Just like the rest of us. Will you humble yourself before the Lord and cry out, Abba, Father? Will you obey the gospel? Doesn't make much sense to me. I've had logic courses. I've studied this thing. I've studied this algorithm. It don't make a lot of sense. It's the Word of God. And your faith is credited as righteousness. Will you obey? Will you humble yourselves? This kingdom's real. And as we sing, you have an opportunity to become a part of the kingdom. To have your sins washed away to be made new. And as we sing today, if you have a decision to become a Christian or to rededicate your life, won't you come as we sing?